Hi and welcome. Today we're going to talk about a very emotive subject, which is EVs and particularly EV fires. Let's jump into it. Hi, John. You've been involved in the rollout of EVs globally over 15 years now. So I'm keen to draw on your expertise and tell me how many EV fires have actually occurred? Well, Mark, it's quite interesting in terms of the number of EVs sold and coming back to fires. There's so much discussion about it. And there's a lot of people saying it's a major issue. And then a lot of other people saying, no, it's not an issue at all. So that's why it's so important to try and get into the facts and have a look and see what is actually the truth or not. And, and that's why it's great to, for you and I just to dig into it a bit and have a look at what is actually happening in that sector. Because when you look at the actual volume, there's been about 30 million EVs sold. And in terms of electric vehicles that have caught fire, there's been around 393. It's not that many. No. If you look at Australia, for instance, there it's a lot less. Here we've got 100,000 EVs driving around, and there's been around seven fires. Now, if you break down those seven fires, I think three were in a building that got burnt down, so the actual fire didn't originate from the battery. One, the vehicle drove over debris on the road, and that caused the fire in the battery. Another one was from arson, so it's not really the battery's fault. Another one was the battery had actually been removed from the vehicle and caught fire, so it was actually, there was problem with the battery and they were trying to repair it so that's and then there was one actual fire caused from the battery so it's, it's a very small amount so in terms of percentage terms evs worldwide percentage is 0.001 percent of electric vehicles have caught fire in some way and if you compare that to ice engines ice engines it's about 0.1 percent so doing a comparison in terms of EVs against ice engines, ice engines have caught fire 100 times more than electric vehicles. So in terms of that, it's fairly insignificant. But then you have to look at the average age of electric vehicle on the road is probably four to five years, where internal combustion engine is between 12 and 15 years. So is that going to make any difference going forward? I, I don't know. The other part of that is there's only a very small proportion of electric vehicles driving on the road. So very few have been involved in accidents. So we don't know as those numbers increase and more and more get involved in accidents, what are going to be the implications of that. So in terms of pure numbers at this stage, it's very small. Whether it will change going forward, I don't know. But it still it makes it interesting to look at. With 30 years' experience in auto logistics and state of the art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all in one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. Please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. It's an interesting question about even ice fires. Like ice fires, people think that it's the fuel that is catching fire and burning from our time in OEMs, you know, the, the, the real emotive place about ice with fires with traditional vehicles is actually the electrics. They're the, they're the items, you know, battery terminals and uh, fusible links not doing their job or issues around high current drawers that cause wires to melt and then start fires. So it's funny how we think ice means, an ice engine means the fuel explodes or catches fire. But in many cases, in the traditional internal combustion vehicle, the fire is actually caused by the electrics. Uh, and that's why when you, you'll often see safety recalls, they're, most of the time they're surrounding electrical issues. And when you look at house fires, the, uh, the biggest cause there is ele are electrical issues. So if there's a lot of emotion around electricity. You know? So you know, electricity is an amazing product, but there are, it does come with its risks and it needs to be managed and respected. And I think that's where it's, it's, I think it's a difficult one to compare ice versus EV. And I think you raised some very good points that you're comparing a small sample size versus a large sample size. And even with the large sample size, we're not really looking at what causes those fires in that large sample size. Because as I said, 
many or most of the safety recalls that are thermally related aren't necessarily a fuel leak. Some are, some have, you know, we've got fuel pumps have issues, but in the in the main, they're usually electrical problems that cause shorts, that cause wires to overheat, that then cause the plastic components in the vehicle to catch fire, which then increases the, the combustion through the other fluids in the vehicle. So the upside, you don't have a fuel source uh, that is uh, combustible that's sitting in a tank somewhere, but the downside is you've got a battery that we know causes thermal issues in the long run in the main with ICE vehicles. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. There's a lot of emotion, but on the surface, though, if you look at those the questions there, they, it's quite relevant to say that you know, EVs aren't the plague of fires at this stage, but you know when the sample size gets a bit bigger and they get a bit older, and then you get the vehicles into the aftermarket or not necessarily maintained as well as they should or not repaired as appropriately as they should. It'll be interesting to see what what happens from a fire perspective with that. So I think, Mark, that's where you make a very good point. It's that the care taken to look after those vehicles. And unfortunately, we have people who don't always that responsible in the way they drive vehicles and care for them to look after them. And I think that's where the issues might start to rise. So it might not be as a result of the the battery and, and the vehicle itself, but it's how the person was looking after it. And I think that's where the issues might start to come. We talked about before about this, the sources of combustion. So what can cause an EV fire to ignite and to start in the first place? Mark, I think it's a really good question. But I think to start with, we have to mention that the batteries are very well made and they've been designed to be in a vehicle. They go through rigorous crash testing and that. So they're pretty robust type batteries. And every battery has a, a battery management system that's continually checking the temperature, the voltage, the current. And if it picks up any issues, it immediately will cut the power off and provide warnings to the, to the driver. So, so there's a lot of built-in safety me- mechanisms. And generally, people are often concerned that charging is an issue. As long as you've got a decent charger installed in your house and it gets charged properly, there shouldn't be an issue from charging. The issue comes from if the battery is damaged or if there's a fault with the battery or if it's been underwater, especially salt water, for instance. So any of these type of things can cause a problem. And that's why they're always saying, if you in an accident, doesn't matter how small the accident is, you need to take the vehicle immediately to your dealer to have the battery checked. So you can't even go home and charge it and then say, well, I'll take the, battery, the vehicle there tomorrow. So if there's been a felt fire and the fire is actually burnt under the vehicle, if it's been in an accident, been in water, any of these type of things, you immediately need to get the, the vehicle across to the dealer to, to have it checked. That's an interesting point that you raise. So I'm just thinking... We talk about EVs and, and we know that it's actually a behavioural change to drive one. Well, I suppose the key for adoption is how much behaviour do you need to change from the current state to adopt an EV with the same peace of mind that you have with an ICE vehicle. ICE vehicles, you know, you drive them, oh, I'm running a bit low, where's the nearest service? There's one there, I'll fill up, by I go. So you raise a good point. So if I'm driving down the beach and I'm, say, driving a vehicle that I can drive under the sand. So if I sort of get it caught out with the tide sort of come in and out, if there's a bit of salt water that sort of laps to the bottom of the car and I drive it away, do I need to have my car looked at to see if that salt water potentially has harmed or, or could uh, impact that battery? I think it depends on the amount of salt water. But to me, they said, from looking at the documents that I read through, and that it looks like salt is a big issue. So if you've been in salt water, you might have driven through a small stream or whatever, crossing on the beach, that could have put water up towards the battery. I would then have it checked. It's something I think I'd be a bit nervous just to leave it. Because if issues do happen, and we can talk about some of these issues going forward, but if some of the issues do happen, the devastation can be quite severe. So it's something, I think with an electric vehicle, it's something you don't want to take the risk. because. The consequence can be so bad. And I think that's an important point to understand. 
and I'm, if I think of the European and even the American roads where they put salt on the roads and you're driving along so there's salt on the roads and you drive over a rock or something that potentially cracks the housing that houses the battery or that area and you get salt water ingress. So that would be something that you'd really need to be checked, get checked quite quickly. Well, I think crack the bottom. I think that's like sitting debris or whatever. That you definitely need to go and have the vehicle checked. And around salt water, there didn't seem to be concern about salt spray. It was more concerned about submerged in, in salt water. So that seemed to be the concern. So any water, but especially salt water, emphasize that. So on the freeway you're driving along, a truck's dropped some building rubble that they're transporting to the landfill. You run over it, bang, clunk, clunk, clunk as it goes under the car. How often does that happen? We've had that many times, no doubt, a lot of the listeners while they're driving. That sort of event should be then get the vehicle checked straight away. I think depending on the severity of that, especially if there's been any sort of damage underneath the car. To me, I think I'd, I'd get a check, talk to someone who's more experienced at it to know exactly what to do. What's the difference between an EV fire and an internal combustion fire? Aren't they the same? Fire is fire? For Mark, there's probably two really key points. The first is the internal combustion engine fire will burn at 1,500 degrees, whereas the EV fire will burn at 5,000 degrees. Wow, that's a big difference. Yeah, you know, a lot hotter and more severe. The second part of that is the EV fire gives off toxic gases and huge amounts between 600 and 1,500 litres per kilowatt hour. So there's a huge amount of toxic gas given off. And the, the thing about that, which to me is quite scary, is when it starts giving off that gas, you might give off that gas before it actually starts to burn. And then that gas is combustible, highly combustible. And that might cause an a explosion. So you've got first the toxic fumes, that could be an issue, and then that gas could then explode after it. And then what the third thing they have is what they call a thermal runaway. Because each of the compartments in the battery are designed to protect it, but once it gets to a certain stage, it just starts to accept, the fire starts to accelerate through the battery. And once that happens, it becomes very difficult to control. And once that thermal runaway goes, it, then it just the, the fire just accelerates to a large extent, and, and that becomes very difficult to manage. The other thing is, on an internal combustion engine, the fire uses oxygen, but battery fire does not use oxygen. Why, why doesn't it need I would have thought you need oxygen for any fire. My understanding, I'm not an expert in this area, so I don't think it has to be, but my understanding is the type of chemicals that are being burned. So you can't put a suppressant. So normally, internal combustion engine fire, you could actually put a blanket over the whole car, suppress the oxygen, and it would suppress the fire. You can't do that with a electric vehicle fire. And then the, the next part of it is they say for an internal combustion engine, 1,200 litres of water to put out the fire. But for an EV engine, it will take about 30,000 litres. So it's a huge amount of water that they need to bring to the fire point to actually try and suppress that fire. So this is where the, the issues start to come in. If it's the fire is in a basement of a building, that's where issues could start to become play because it's giving all these toxic fumes. So the firemen have to have special suits. They're a lot more expensive than the normal suits that the firemen would normally have. And the big thing they are wary of is the cobalt poisoning that they can get from the poisonous view from the fire. It's interesting, isn't it? What are the problems once the fire's been put out? Yeah, I think this is where the big part is, because if you've used 30,000 litres of water to put this fire up, that water is now contaminated. It's more contaminated than for an ice engine. How do you collect that contaminated water and how do you dispose of it? So that becomes a major issue, because if it's, you know, depending where it is, it will be become very difficult to, to collect that um, contaminated water. The second part of it is that the engine or the battery can reignite 
up to 14 days after it's been put out. So it's quite a long period where that, that battery can just recombust again. So once the fires are put out, you have to be very careful with it because at any stage it could be written out. So you can't just load it on the back of a truck and drive off with some, but you have to now find, get a metal container, put it in the metal container, which is extremely difficult. There could still be toxic fumes coming in. It could still reignite. So you have to put it in a metal container. You have to then take it to some place to store it for two, two and a half weeks, make sure that it's properly put out. Once that's done, you then have to take it out of it and you have to start to try and dismantle it piece by piece. And that probably done by hand because you can't just put it into a crushing machine and crush the whole vehicle like you'd normally do with the RC. So, so you then have to dismantle it by hand and then try and recycle all those parts. So it's not an easy process. So this is where the challenges start to come in. That's incredible. It's almost a bit like uh, a bit of a Game of Thrones, uh, the uh, the White Walkers, they just keep coming back. <laughs> that's, kind of scary. that's a bit of a scary thought. But once again, we're talking about something that is rare, but possible. And will this be? Will there be more instance of this when the car park gets bigger? So the more EVs you have, the more risks of this stuff happening. The more risks of the people who are dealing with it not being necessarily trained or aware of this instance. It's the sort of stuff where it, you know, if you know, and obviously the OEM people will know that this is a potential. So does a person who's been towing cars or breakdowns for the last 40 years in their late 50s, early 60s, driving a tow truck, picks up a damaged one of these, just throws it on the back, looks like the fire's been put out with a fire extinguisher. They drive it off to their yard for storage before they work out where to take it. And next thing, the next day, the whole yard's been burnt because the thing's just uh, spontaneously combusted. Is that Am I fantasizing about that, John, or is that a realistic possibility? No, Mark, what I think is they're doing a lot of training with the fire departments and with people involved in towing vehicles and, and those aspects of it. So I think there's a lot being done in that. So they, those people are getting pretty well educated. There is always a risk that someone might, maybe in a rural area or hasn't done the training or those things might happen. But I don't. I, I think the issue is going to be with the relying on the people driving the vehicle to do the right thing. And it's not everybody. Ninety nine point nine percent of people always do the right thing, but there always be that point one percent who don't do the right thing. And I think that's where the issues might come in. And I think that brings the. Is for instance, if the vehicle is involved in a collision it will automatically disconnect the power. That's what should happen. But there are two emergency switches on virtually every electric vehicle. There should be two emergency switches, one on each side, where you can reach in and disconnect the power before anything else happens. So there is that safety precaution. But I've been in electric vehicles, and I haven't determined where that disconnection switch is. And we come from the automotive industry. And now I'm starting to think every time I go in an electric vehicle, I could be asking the driver, where's that disconnection switch? Because if there is an accident and something happens, I should be able to know where that switch is to disconnect it straight off the accident. If it had, just in case it hasn't disconnected from the collision. So there are those type things. I'm not saying it will happen, but constantly having very small. But if it does happen, are you prepared for it? So I think this is where the discussions come in. So there is a very small chance of things happening, but what will be the impact when it does happen? So if you do drive at home and park it in your house and charge it and the battery's been damaged and it burns down your whole house or the whole apartment block, someone gets hurt or injured or whatever, who's then responsible for that? Will the insurance company pay? Will it be a comeback on the car company? Will it result in insurance premiums being a lot higher? At the moment, a lot of insurance companies in Australia said, well, they haven't had any claims at the stage from EVs. But 
when they start getting claims, what will happen as a result of that? So those are sort of questions I have in my own mind of where does the responsibility lie if it does happen? Because it can be catastrophic in some cases. Because it accelerates so much, there is so much toxic fumes coming off. So we're looking at inevitability, more EVs on the road. And internal combustion is not going to go away. It's still going to be around. They're going to be around for a long time. So what do you see happening as a car park gets older? So we're going to have more and we're going to get older ones. What's going to be the impact of those EVs? And obviously there's going to be more accidents. Who's going to be responsible for the cleanup costs? But I think that's where the big challenge lies. I think at the moment, because there hasn't been any issues, no one is really worried about it. But once it starts to happen and some of those costs start to get quantified, what will be the implication of it? And can the car company be held liable? I'm not a legal person. Can the car company be held liable if the battery does, if there is an issue with the battery and something does happen in an apartment block and burns the apartment block? I don't know. Well, I think that's where the, where the common law comes into play. What was the, the reasonable person test uh, did, you know, from the law of negligence? Or did the car company do everything within their powers to make the vehicle as safe as possible with the technology available? You would like to think yes, unless the car company's uh, negligent outrage, outrageously so or had a lapse in integrity or skill to or quality to allow a product that's dangerous out on the road. So. Oh, personally, I think it's just going to be horses for courses. It'll just be that there's going to be more fires. I think it's going to be just an insurance thing. I think it's going to be business as usual. You know, there's less moving parts in EVs, therefore there's more investment in batteries. But we know batteries where where the tech is, point of difference. A motor is a motor, so you can rewind a motor as many times as you like and you can tweak a motor. But ultimately, a motor is a three and usually three-phase motor. They're beautiful pieces of electrical engineering they've been around for a long time you can refine them but ultimately it still has uh, an armature that spins within uh like mag- to create magnetic fields and that's how the, the motor works that's just motors you have one two four all that sort of stuff so i i can see it being a interesting lifestyle adjustment and the, the key from what you've just highlighted is you know what what are the obligations for people who drive the type of vehicle? What are the obligations for the people in the aftermarket? Because realistically, it's the aftermarket that's going to be dealing with the majority of this. You know, tow truck operators, crash repairers, vehicle recyclers. You know, we've had recyclers on the show before. Those guys know what what a car is worth from a you know, what parts they can get off it and sell and and, and make money out of it, which is a fantastic business. But yeah, you know, it comes with risks. You know that, that industry had to pivot with ABS and airbags and have been safely removing airbags so people didn't get hurt because they weren't appropriately trained. Now these aren't people who are dealers. These are people who maybe it's a first job, maybe it's a last job. They're not necessarily experts in this area. They may be tow truck drivers, they may be technicians, or just basically labourers who unbolt something and uh, and all of a sudden you, you potentially have risks. So it's going to be an interesting area, this one, uh, one to watch. I think the industry is doing a great job to make it as simple as possible. We've dumbed it down so that you would like to think it is super safe and all the initial bogeyman fears that were allayed by some about EVs and how that you're going to get electrocuted if you don't step out of them appropriately. I think the industry has done a good job to make them as safe as possible. However, we know with all things manufactured, that nothing is perfect. There can be silly things like someone changes contractor for the casing from the existing casing to another one, and there's a flaw in the casing and it allows salt water to get in or whatever to get out, and then you can have problems. But these, this is the nature of the auto industry, and that's why we love it. Thank you for listening. Hopefully you uh, got some value out of the conversation around the, the EV fire potential and the, the bogeyman in the detail. There's some good questions. The industry is definitely adapting to it, but it's what the broader market will do is the key as we go forward and more of these vehicles are on the road. Thanks very much for listening. We'll talk to you again next week.